Well, thank you for coming. This is the 10th in the series of interviews that started a week ago. And one thing I'm certainly learning is, much like a church, is no one wants to sit in front. <laughs> but if any of you who are in the back want to come up and sit here, these are very comfortable chairs. Uh, if you start falling asleep, I'll throw a water bottle at you and wake you up. But anyway, uh, I don't think you'll fall asleep because uh, this is one of my, my favorite guys in Washington. Although, are you, in Wa are you actually in Washington if you live on a houseboat, as you do? Well, you know, I'm kind of, I'm offshore, so I'm not sure how that qualifies, yeah. I'm so, <laughs> you could set up your own pirate radio station. That's right, yeah. Like that. yeah. Anyway, uh, Carl Zinsmeister, uh, we've known each other for a long time. Uh, he was uh, editor editor-in-chief of the American Enterprise, a terrific magazine from 1994 to 2006, at which point public service beckoned and you became uh, George W. Bush's uh, chief domestic policy advisor in the White House for those years, up until January of 2009. Uh, Carl was a, was a history major <coughs> and a national champion rower at Yale. Um, he's written 13 books, including the wonderful almanac of American philanthropy that gives all kinds of information. If you're interested in that field, that's what you should look at. He's also uh, written a couple of books, uh, one of them, uh, Boots on the Ground, about his experience as an embedded journalist with the, uh, the 82nd Airborne in Iraq. So rowing, embedded journalist in, in Iraq with some hazardous circumstances there, magazine editor, author, chief domestic policy advisor, and lives on a houseboat. Um, with with three three kids who now have produced three grandchildren yeah. thus far. Thus far, yeah. Thus far. Yeah. Um, tell us about the houseboat for a minute. I'm just fascinated by that. Uh, yeah, well, um, the short version of all that is my, my family says I can't hold a job. That's kind of, you know, attention deficit disorder or something. But I do, I do like the variety and the opportunity to, to, to kind of get into all parts of this tremendous American culture we have, which is so riotously varied. And one of the pleasures of journalism, as Marvin and I practice it, is you get to talk to and meet all different kinds of people. And the houseboat is partly my... Uh, accommodation to the man in the gray flannel suit. I mean, Washington is a, is a wonderful city in a lot of ways, uh, but it's a very um, kind of buttoned down and staid city, very interested in in success and power. And I'm, I'm a real middle American guy. I just, I like guys who fish and tinker with engines and do all that stuff. I grew up that way. And you find that when you walk through the marina gate and the, and the gate slams behind you and I get out on the docks, you, you, you see people that you don't see in most of the rest of Washington. So it's a nice antidote for me. And uh, that's always the kind of way I've lived my life. I'd like to have kind of a, a little bit of a life of my hands as well as a life of my mind. They're very different things. I wouldn't want to only have to work with my hands. I feel privileged and very blessed and lucky that I can, can work with my brain for much of the day. But I do often find myself wanting to do something more concrete more kind of physical sometimes and uh and living on a boat is part of that you have to pay attention to the weather you have to yeah you know, sometimes you have to double up your lines and you have to fix things all the time i like tools i like to work with my hands and that gives me an excuse to do so and you built a house at one point right is that or, or... multiple houses yeah. yeah when i was uh, those of you who might be considering journalism i know some of the patrick henry folks do um it's a great field but Find a day job <laughs> if you're considering freelancing like I did. I freelanced for a lot of years, and it was really the best way to establish my career. I was able to write on exactly what I wanted to write about. I didn't have to write what other people thought was important. I chose my own topics. But the flip side of that is you don't have a steady income. So during the years when I was um, working as a freelance writer, I also worked as a carpenter. I basically bought old junk houses that nobody else wanted in Washington, D.C., and, and camped out in them before I got married and fix them up while I lived in this kind of the shells. And then as soon as they got nice, and then I would sell them. So it was a bit of a death wish, but um, I did that eight times. And okay. it, it really, and including when my family started to arrive. So it kind of kept us in groceries and diapers in those lean years early on before I got my byline established. Yeah, terrific. Um, this is the, uh, uh, the, the publication. You are now vice president of publications for the Philanthropy Roundtable. And this is philanthropy. Uh, I recommend it as a, um, a really good way to go deeper into the part of American life that doesn't get emphasized a lot on newspapers and magazines. Mm -hmm. uh, American Enterprise, by the way, I always enjoyed because you would have people from different mm -hmm. parts of the country writing about their farming activities and this and that. So it was yeah, a, a different, different from the usual Washington stuff where everything is, in a sense, a sweet level view from the from the 30th floor, perhaps, and mm -hmm. at the mere mortals walking on the sidewalks. Mm -hmm. So um, 
We want to talk tonight about philanthropy. And um, uh, Carl, as a, as a journalist, knows how to present information colorfully. And he has some really interesting uh, pie charts up here in, uh, in the section about how religion and generosity feed each other in fascinating ways. Um, what, what I think is fascinating is that uh, so many Americans, according to surveys, believe that the charitable work and service that happens across America, including providing food and clothing and disaster relief, well, it just happens. Uh, and it would happen even if there weren't uh, religious people, uh, religious organizations doing this. But one of the things you've found out is, well, that's hardly the truth. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, well, it's, um, you know, in theory, there are lots of ways to be a good person. We all know that. And you can, you can be interested in the welfare of your fellow human being f for a whole variety of reasons. But in practice, you know, today, we, we had an interview with Tim Keller a couple of years ago, and he made a good point. He said, you know, everyone talks all the time about community today and about, you know, being, uh, living f f with other people's uh, needs in mind as well as your own and all that. And that's great. But when it comes to actually sacrificing your own self-interest and changing your life and giving up some of your income and some of your time to make sure that other people have interesting lives too, that's much rarer. And there are very few institutions that actually encourage, help, and indeed insist on that. One of the most important of which is religion. Religion doesn't have suggestions, it has commandments. And it says you shall take an interest in the welfare of your fellow man. The universe doesn't center around you, it's not all about you. And so religion is a terribly important inf influence in, in, uh, in society to get us out of our shells and to, and to encourage us to, to, to show some concern for the, the thriving of our, fellow, uh, of our fellow men and women. And so uh, the reality is, I mean, what I try to document in this story, Marvin, as you know, is I really walk through the, a lot of the data and, 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 and look at very specific things. Who actually is it that adopts children, for instance? Well, Christians adopt hard to place children at the rate of 5%, whereas the, rate, the rest of the country adopts them at the rate of 2%, two and a half times the rate. If you look at who actually mentors people coming out of prison today, some people are mentored by a whole range of people, but the, the biggest bulk of individuals you find really putting their money where their mouth is and doing the hard work of helping those folks not return to a life of crime are very often religious folks. You know, who is it that actually runs the homeless shelters? Um, there's research uh, that I cite here that found that six out of 10 of the beds for homeless people that are provided in major urban areas now come from uh, uh, religious, uh, religiously inspired groups. So you can go through the whole panoply, you know, education, alternative education, hospitals, all kinds of areas. A lot of the selfless work that gets done in our society today, in fact, a predominance of it, is done by religious people, religious organizations with a religious motivation. And if that motivation goes away, we have a much colder, much more selfish, much more heartless society. Yeah, so these nice uh, pie charts here show that, for example, uh, did you do volunteer work in the past seven days? Uh, Americans who attend church weekly and pray daily are 67% more likely to do that than other Americans. Uh, giving to the poor in the past seven days by donating money, time, or goods. Again, for those who attend church weekly, pray daily, uh, more than 60% more likely to, uh, to do that. Uh, annual charitable donations. Pe persons with some rel religious affiliation, uh, more than twice as much as those with no affiliation. And in fact, uh, people who attend religious services 27 to 52 times per year, so it's at least every other week and often every week, uh, are four times, uh, are giving four times as much as people who never attend religious services. So across the board, yep. Uh, and yet, if you ask people, uh, well, would all these good works still happen if there were no people of faith or religious organization to do them, 57% uh, of the people say, yes, it would happen anyway. So there's a communication gap going on here. There sure is. And you know, I think a lot of it comes from a, a rising hostility to religion. I and mean, there is a feeling that not only is religion not necessary for you to be a good person, but there's active antipathy for religion in, increasingly in our society. And you see that in ways that really would have been startling a few years ago. I mean, a couple of years ago, the religion columnist of the New York Times called for taking away the uh, tax exemption for churches 
publicly in the paper. Um, that kind of startled me. That's a, that's a really deep historic tra American tradition, and that's a s stark thing to propose in, in the public square. Um, so there is this, this, uh, this rising, um, I think, hostility toward religion, which is, is really blinding to people to the, the way it works. Now, Marvin and I would, be, and I'm sure most of us in this room, would be very resistant to the idea that religion is handy because it produces good social results. You know, we don't, we don't find our faith because we, we want to have more, more, more good results coming out of the other end of the pipe. You either have faith or you don't. You, you feel it or you don't. You recognize your place in a vast universe or you don't. But for people who, for whom this is a foreign concept, for people who don't have a personal faith, I, I would hope they would at least see that religious people act very differently in the world, that they, they, they simply have different priorities and principles that they put into effect, and that in most cases, those are very pro-social as opposed to anti-social uh, behaviors. Uh, but that, that factual reality is increasingly lost in, in public debates. Yeah, and just some other statistics here that you might think, well, sure, these are people who are going to uh, religious services, and so they are contributing to their church. But, uh, but actually, uh, people who attend religious services 27 to 52 times per year are 30% uh, more likely. Uh, they, they give 30% more to secular causes than people who are strictly secularists and that they never go. Um, so both in the, in the frequency of giving and the average amount, 73% um, of all American charitable giving goes to religiously inspired organizations. Uh, and, on, and on we go, as you mentioned, the rates of adopting children, um, creating alternative schools. We've heard so much about the charter school development, which is, which is big and often good over the past a few years, and there are three million kids who go to charter schools, but you point out that how many go to religious schools? More. More, 3.8 3. million. Yep. Um, hospital beds, uh, beds for the homeless, 58% uh, of them provided by faith-based organizations. Um, you know, we, uh, uh, Starbucks outlets in the U.S., here's a little fun fact, uh, almost 14,000, but religious congregations in the U.S., almost 350,000. Right. Um, yet there's, we probably hear more about Starbucks, actually, than, uh, than, than churches. We do. Um, and then social uses of houses of worship, and I want to ask you a little bit about, about the, the problems some churches have in getting a place to even meet, but uh, of all, if, if you take buildings... Uh, where there are uh, churches and synagogues, church and synagogue buildings, 89% uh, of the visits that they receive are for daycare or school or community programs and so forth. So even the religious buildings as such are used for causes that, well, glorify God by helping all kinds of people right. doing that. So um, this, is, this is huge, and it's really an unreported story. Mm -hmm. So... Um, one thing you, you, you mentioned in here is the, the difficulty that, uh, well, a kind of mix, a mismatch mm. between there are a lot of very venerable churches right. in lovely old buildings, there are a few congregant members rattling around in the pews, right. uh, but they can keep it open, keep going, because they have uh, money that's been set aside uh, for that, whereas you see all these booming congregations that are desperately looking for a place, mm. and... Uh, they're often, sometimes they're being chased out of public schools. Right. But to tell, tell us about how churches and cities are, are tr struggling to find geography. Yeah, that's a really big topic. And again, completely unreported, yeah. Mar Marvin. Um, I have a kind of a parlor game that I play. I bet some of you do too. When I go to a city, I love to just try the local churches and kind of see what you can learn about local culture yeah. by attending services. And so I've been to a lot of places over the years, and what would be some examples? For instance, there's a, there's a very interesting church in Santa Monica, California area. It has multiple branches, but it's basically Santa Monica, called Pacific Crossroads. And I attended there, and it was in the Santa Monica Public High School. And you cannot imagine a less inspiring environment to have a church service. I mean, it was really kind of a drab 1950s high school. And they had a, a very wonderful service, but there's a lot of energy was expended in setting up the signs in the parking lot and trying to transform the interior of this auditorium into a semi-sacred space in very short order and then breaking it all down when you're done. There are all kinds of churches all over the country that go through this every weekend. They're, they're meeting in schools, they're meeting 
meeting in shopping centers. They're, they're orphaned congregations who meet in, on Saturday nights in somebody else's church. Uh, they're Korean congregations that are booming but don't have their own place to, to meet. So they, again, they have to kind of piggyback on somebody. And there's a couple interesting things going on here. One of the first things I want to say is there is a, I think, a misguided argument among many evangelicals that this is almost a good thing that they're not getting bogged down with bricks and mortar. They're not wasting their money on buildings. And I understand that. Buildings can become a terrible distraction, but you know what? There's a reason that for hundreds and thousands of years, human beings sacrificed to have sacred structures, structures that felt sacred when you walked into them. If you've ever been in an Orthodox church, it's a little bit of heaven on earth, all right? If you've ever been in one of the great Gothic cathedrals, there were very poor, destitute farmers who sacrifice everything to build those cathedrals over periods of hundreds of years. There's a human impulse that wants to have a place that you can retreat to that feels spiritual. And you don't get that when you're meeting in a suburban shopping mall or when you're meeting in an underground parking garage like Tim Keller's church is in in Manhattan where I've attended many times. Uh, Literally in an underground converted parking garage. And his other branches are in a Salvation Army uh, Center and uh, one of them's at the Ethical Culture. I mean, God bless them all for making these things work and for patching along, but these are not optimal ways to sort of try to find our maker's infinity. Uh, uh, And as Marvin mentioned earlier, the really weird thing is this spatial mismatch. You do have many beautiful sacred spaces in most cities, and again, I go into all of those too. But many of the great cathedrals and Episcopal churches and, and Catholic churches in these big cities are empty or are attended by 15 little white-haired ladies on Sundays. I, I was in a couple this weekend. Um, and it's very sad. So one of the things I propose is that if we're going to really um, get uh, kind of supercharge and kickstart uh, religious activity and overcome some of the suspicion that we've been talking about and, and get churches back to serving Uh, as real centers of energy in urban areas, we have to do a couple of things. And one of them is to solve this spatial mismatch. And I don't think it should be that hard. One of the things I suggest in my article, um, as Marvin knows, is I sort of say, let's, rather than reinvent the wheel, let's steal a page from the playbook of the charter school movement, one of the most successful kind of social entrepreneurial movements of the last generation. And the charter folks figured out a couple things earlier on. And one of them was that buildings matter. And you can have a brilliant idea, wonderful principle, great teachers, a fine mission, but if you don't have a place to do it, it's not going to happen. And this has become a crushing burden on many charter schools. New York City has a real problem today. There's lots of people that want to start impressive schools but don't have a physical spot to do it. Uh, And likewise, there are many people with, I think, very inspired church visions that don't have an adequate place to do it. So uh, I, I think... In my article here, I'm speaking mostly to donors and, and Philanthropy Magazine, for obvious reasons, we talk to people who have money to give away for good causes. And I'm, I'm trying to encourage donors to think hard about helping uh, churches either build new spaces if necessary or perhaps use some of those old spaces that can no longer be maintained by their vestigial congregations. Maybe we could do a swap where that those little white-haired ladies could to get a nice intimate little church where they can really meet and have a fellowship that means something to them rather than rattling around in a huge stone cathedral they can't even heat properly and get those big booming churches out of the strip malls and into the space that was built to really make you feel like you're in heaven for an hour and a half. Um, so that's, uh, that's one of the, uh, the places I think there's great potential. Let me just ask about that. I mean, there are financial questions involved, but there are also ideological or perhaps theological questions where sometimes the people who own those churches, Mm -hmm. they're very hostile to evangelicals or others, and they don't want to have their buildings used. Uh, What do you do in a situation like that? It really has to be overcome. I mean, what's happening in a lot of cases, uh, Marvin, as you point out, is people are so stubborn about those crazy uh, theological or ideological differences that they'd rather have the church be desacralized and turned into a condominium or a bar. This is happening in large numbers. I have the numbers in the in this article. I use mm-hmm. I have the data where the conversions of churches to to other uses is is really growing fast and that's a tragedy not only from the sacred point of view but just from these kind of communal arguments that that Marvin was was invoking a few minutes ago. Churches are the places where the AA meetings get held. Churches are where the art fairs take place. Churches are where the daycares are in the basement of. Those are really important social functions. Those things don't happen anymore when it becomes a restaurant or when it becomes a condo or a bar. So um, to lose these big 
open communal spaces in the middle of major cities is a kind of a one-time loss. You will never replace those. The expenses of New York City or San Francisco or DC are such that you will never have a similarly available public space once it goes. So even if you aren't especially sensitive to the, the religious motivation here, you ought to be concerned about this just as a, as a matter of community building. So that's, I think, an argument we can use with some of those uh, vestigial congregations to say, look, Let's work around this, and we can edge into it. One of the ways you can do this, you, you start out by renting your congregation on Saturday nights to the big booming church, and that's happening a lot. I, I attend a lot of churches where the Saturday night congregation fills the place, and then Sunday morning they have a tiny, but as, as Marvin mentioned, those, the Sunday morning congregation has, has an endowment. That's, that's the reason that they own the church and the other guys don't. They have 100, year, 100 years of, of, of built-up resources that allow them to kind of limp along and keep the lights on, barely. Um, but it really isn't optimal for either group. As I say, that the, those smaller congregations might have a much more vigorous and exciting and, and authentic and warm worship life together if they could sort of match their physical space a little more closely to the size of their, uh, of their social group. So there's a role for philanthropy here as far as uh, uh, perhaps some, some well-heeled people making mm -hmm. funds available so they can actually, if it comes to that, they can outbid the condominium yep. folks. Uh, Public policy, uh, uh, let's say if congregations are stuck with using schools, um, in how many cities do you have a sense or, of, of that they're able to do that? And how mm. many other places are they being mm. chased out or told you don't belong here? Uh, how is that going? Because I know it's been a fight in New York City and other places. Yes, yeah. I, you know, I'd love to know those numbers, Marvin. I feel bad. I, 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 I didn't actually look those up in the course of this. I, I would very much like to know what the kind of the battleground looks like because there are cities that are relatively open to this possibility and there are others that make it extremely hard for churches to rent. Um, but um, I, I don't know. I really don't know what that data is. And, but there are other aspects of public policy. I believe there's a Supreme Court case this year, actually, that is, uh, centers on the question of whether churches should be able to access historic preservation uh, rights and historic preservation protections that other buildings are, are, and are able to get. Um, that's the sort of thing that might help some of these um, beautiful old churches, some of which are really starting to crumble and fall apart in, uh, in a very sad way. And it isn't just the physical vessel. The physical vessel matters. I've tried to make that argument, particularly with evangelicals who are sometimes dubious about that. I, I do think that's something we need to be, take more seriously. But even more important, the, another piece that I mentioned in, in my article where I think not only donors but all kinds of people could help is in leadership. Um, now, the, the burgeoning churches, almost by definition, tend to have pretty good leadership. That's why they're burgeoning in many cases. They've hewn to a, a, a more orthodox theology. They, they have energy. They, they make demands on people. And strangely enough, when you make demands on people, people like it. I mean, th this is the paradox. I mean, people think that, oh, don't be too strict or don't be too hard or, or you'll drive people away. Actually, the verdict in most churches is that it's the reverse. It's like the Marine Corps. The harder you make it, the more people love it, the more people they want to be part of it. And there's something to that, I think, in theology as well. So many of the, the, the leaders uh, of these growing churches are, are good, but they, like all leaders, need help. They need respite. They need training. And the average person coming out of seminary today comes out with about $50,000 worth of debt. That's a big, heavy stone when you're looking at a pastor's salary for most of your life. Uh, if we could help train some of these folks so they didn't come out with debt, if we could give them continuing education possibilities so that they could freshen their skills and learn new tricks um, w without having to abandon their congregation, if we could um, have um, paths that allowed second career uh, pastors, people who had a career in business, for instance, or in academe and suddenly feel the call and would like to become a pastor, that's very hard to do today. Mm -hmm. um, if you had night classes, if you had seminaries that were more open to video instruction, things like that, you could have more of these second career people who I have, I have found in my personal life to be often extremely powerful pastors because they've lived kind of a dual life and, and they, they often have a, a, a really powerful message to, to bring to, uh, to their flocks. Um, so that's another area, I think, leadership training, uh, leadership development, where all of us really could, could give uh, uh, churches a big boost if we would think more like social entrepreneurs and how could we create fellowships. I mean, again, to, to return to the charter school analogy, ch charter schools created things like Teach for America, like um, uh, all kinds of fellowship programs, all kinds of incubators for people who have a 
want to become a principal, have an idea for a school, but need to work on it? Well, there, there are lots of ways you can win a fellowship at this point and spend a year noodling on your charter school idea, perfecting it, coming up with a business plan, finding people who will support you in it. We ought to be doing the same thing to support entrepreneurial churches. Um, and, um, you know, I, if we do, I, th I think there's a real opportunity here to, to, to get some of those young folks who are drifting out of the church in very rapid, at a very rapid rate um, back into a place where they would feel comfortable and excited, in fact, about uh, having a community of worship around them. Okay, so you're working with philanthropists who sometimes have money and, and urging them to think in these terms. What about folks here who are going to be graduating shortly? And, you know, they're, they're here, they've come tonight because they're interested in this. Right. What would you advise them to think about? Well, there's a third place. There's a huge opening, I think, in, in churches and, and, and in parachurches, if you will, um, which is to, to apply more of the kind of social entrepreneurial approach to religious life. What would be a couple examples? Um, well, for instance, there was, there was actually a program that was incubated at the Philanthropy Roundtable where I work, um, which has had some very interesting results. The, the whole notion was that churches need to learn data science, contemporary data science and micro-targeting, and then use that to attack social problems. And specifically, this group, uh, which was called the Culture of Freedom Initiative that we incubated at the Roundtable, um, was devoted to the idea of using, helping churches create powerful marriage ministries with, uh, with a good kind of a scientific basis. So we would first help them identify the people in their neighborhood within five miles of their church who are at high risk of either divorcing or not marrying in the first place or having a child out of wedlock or otherwise having a, a, a problematic entry into family life. First identify them then kind of uh, invite them to take part in uh, some sort of a marriage ministry or, or, or a family ministry and, and, and then give them training and give them a kind of a community of fellowship around them that would support them. And this uh, experiment had very positive results on a pilot basis in Jacksonville, Florida, where over a three-year period, there was a 28% decrease in the divorce rate in Jacksonville. So this is now something that's going to be replicated in, in other places. So that's a so kind of... Let me just ask, so, so you're actually targeting that specific population that's at the at most risk yes and how do you find how do you find that what's the well that's again the what the kind of the value add of, of this for nonprofit is they go to churches with some pretty good data science tools and they say we they work with vendors you know sophisticated uh computer-based you know vendors who will do the same thing that any pollster does or any corporation does today to find who are the people that are about to buy a sofa you know, the furniture companies know that. Don't ask me how. I said they probably find out who just bought a house. And they know that the other shoe falling is to buy a sofa. Well, you use that same kind of logic and that same sort of technology to figure out who is very likely to be in the marriage market in one way or another in the future. Mm -hmm. And so then you send them a piece of mail or, or a Facebook ad or, a, uh, or, a, or, a, or some sort of a, a, a Google touch, a Google ad touch, and you make it make them aware that there's something in their neighborhood that's a, it's a, it's a, and they, they generally packaged as fun, you know, it's a date night or it's a, it's a meet your neighbors thing or something. And then you kind of get them in the door and you have some serious programming. Um, so that's uh, an example. Another example, uh, Marvin, that you and I care a lot about is kind of work for people who are really struggling, struggling economically. This might seem commonsensical, but it's re remarkably underprovided. Um, we are working with a, a nonprofit in, again in Florida in this case that realized that we have this, another mismatch in this country. We have a lot of people who want work but don't quite know how to get that first step on the employment ladder. And we have a lot of small businesses who are desperate for welders or truck drivers or, or LPNs or daycare workers. And they realized that churches could be a place that make that connection. So they basically set up an initiative that uses churches as the venue. The basements are big and open and wide, and, and they know how to, how to welcome people and throw a potluck and, you know, get people in the door. And then they brought in a lot of local small business owners who had employment needs, and they matched people. And this is called Flourish Now, and it's basically got churches into the business of t caring about the economic prospects of the people in their neighborhood. So it was a little foreign to a lot of these churches. For that matter, even the marriage and family question, which ought to be in the wheelhouse of a church, you would think. Uh, I believe that Kofi's numbers were that something like 74% of churches don't have any marriage or family ministry in, act in action in their congregation. That's a tragedy. I mean, that ought to be something that the churches lead on. They ought to be doing more of that than almost any other social institution. So those are examples of the kind of places where people like this can get involved in very interesting social work. Well, you mentioned Jacksonville with that pilot project. Uh, uh, this last, where are you seeing 
programs that help. Do you, do you have examples? And I'm, I'm thinking there was a, there's an editor mm -hmm. of World. Yeah. We should we, we report on these things, but we always want to know more, more of them. Yeah. Who who's doing a good job of this? Where is it working? Yeah. Well, this 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 last the last initiative, this job matching initiative, is organized by a group called Flourish Now, uh -huh. um, which is based in Naples, although it's statewide. And Naples, Florida. Naples, Florida. Yes. Okay. And I think they've. I, I wish I had those numbers at my finger. Excuse me, at my fingertips. I, I believe they've staged something like. 86 of these job fairs or something and have a very okay. high job match rate where people actually walk out the door with an offer after sitting down for brief mini interviews at these little tables that where the the, uh, the local employers are invited to host um, so that is again a very practical and simple thing but it can really make a tremendous change in the quality of life of some of these people in the neighborhood and of course what happens once they have gone to church and gotten a job? Well, they're very easy to invite back to, to worship then on, the week, on that weekend. And that's sort of the, the, the next step. Then you sort of have a communal group that'll support you in other ways. And now that I'm working, you know what? My daycare is hard. What can the church suggest on that front? And, and, and actually, I, I would like to have, you know, I have to work on weekends. So is there somebody who can suggest, you know, ways that I can organize my life to, to, to have, a, you know, a, a book group or something on a Wednesday or, or or have a Wednesday worship service. So again, this kind of opens a door that allows a conversation to take place where all sorts of healthy social interactions can take place uh, with the church as a, as, a, as a meeting ground. Okay, so let's say someone is graduating from Patrick Henry uh, in a month and a half <clears throat> or so, or other colleges as people mm -hmm. read this in World. And, you know, they're, they're, they're smart, they're, they, they can communicate well, um, but they don't really want to, let's say, go to law school and learn how... Uh, if McDonald, if, if, if McDonald is, is suing a, a shipping company or vice versa to get involved in that. They're, they're, they're more people-oriented. Um, they don't really want to go into business. They don't really want to go to law school. They don't want to go through these, these usual paths. They're right. social entrepreneurs. Yeah. What would you recommend? Where, you know, Horace Greeley is supposedly saying, go west, young man. Mm -hmm. What would you say to these young men and women? This is a really, really promising field. I mean, there's a lot of talk about startups today, and um, you know, most of those end up being uh, obviously for-profit companies, but particularly focused in, in in computer industries and that sort of thing. And there's a lot of excitement there too. My sons are in that world themselves. My, themselves, I get that why that appeals, but that's kind of a pretty heavily trodden path at this point, whereas this social entrepreneurship that we're talking about is wide open. It is really a green pasture. There is all kinds of room for social invention there. And if you're an inventive person, which, you know, I think is the, the most fun thing to be in the world and the greatest blessing, if you can pull it off, if you can have an inventive life where you're able to be creative, you're able to find new solutions to old problems, it, it is tremendously satisfying. And there's all kinds of opportunities for that you know, in this area. Now, the downside is you don't have a boss and you don't have a road plan and you don't have a clear recipe book. You have to be self-sufficient. You have to be improvisational. You have to be able to think on your feet. But if you have any of those qualities and you want to make your world better, and you're not focused on the almighty dollar in the short term, although that usually comes through eventually if you're, if you're diligent and you get good at anything. But in the beginning, you, know, you have to be willing to be frugal and, 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 uh, and launch these things on a shoestring sometime, sometimes. There are tremendous opportunities, really exciting things. And there are also lots of donors. Uh, you know, Marvin mentioned philanthropy. I know that for a lot of you, that probably sounds like this long Greek word, word kind of scary, and it's sort of a dusty, dry, old concept. Isn't that like little old ladies giving away money? Actually, no. Philanthropy is a really exciting and important part of American culture. First of all, it's big just in brute, brute terms. It's a, we give away $410 billion every single year in this country, voluntarily, without anybody asking or pushing it. And we give away Sometimes about... Sometimes people are pushing. Well, a little pushing is good. <laughs> but uh, but nobody, nobody has legal power to coerce you. Right. It's not like taxes. Um, but uh, and by the way, we also give away about that much more, about another half a, a, a trillion dollars in... Um, and the value of our volunteer labor. So we're talking about 900 or or, or, or a trillion dollar, 900 billion or a trillion dollar industry. For, so first of all, it's consequential just in sheer brute size, but even more, it's consequential in terms of its, its social role. Uh, philanthropy is how, it's kind of our social venture capital. It's, it, 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 we can take risks with it and try new stuff with it we cannot possibly do with government money or with corporate money. So it, it, it's a much more inventive uh, sector. And there are a lot of people out there with money today wanting to change the world, but they're just kind of stuck. They're sucking their thumb and saying, 
I, I want something exciting, but I, I don't have an idea myself, and no one is coming to me with an idea that lights, my, that lights my jets. So there is all kinds of room for people with entrepreneurial ideas about how to start job fairs at churches or how to get churches into, into, uh, into family ministry using data science or, or, or any, anything else fresh like that. How, how do we solve homeless problems in, in, in new ways? Um, addiction. Addiction is a massive crying need today. I mean, you realize we've had... Actual nationwide declines at our life expectancy for three years in a row in this country. That has never happened in a century, ever. Um, and it's because of addiction. It's because of drug, drug, drug abuse. And we're all just at sea. There, is no, there are no good answers today about uh, addiction. That is a vast field for a, a savvy, uh, empirical, quick-learning social entrepreneur to come in and figure out ways to chip away at that. And you have to avoid the temptation to think, oh, i got to fix it all myself, I mean, because that will overwhelm you. But what any smart uh, philanthropist does is it's a very decentralized field. You just fix your little area, your little piece. You do your thing, and then you realize you're part of an army. There are millions of Americans who do this. And if everyone kind of tends their little garden, pretty soon the whole country looks green. So uh, you have to avoid this kind of megalomaniac thinking that says, if it ain't huge and it ain't scalable and I'm not solving, uh, saving 100,000 lives, it's not worth my time. Baloney. You have to start small and demonstrate a principle, and you do it first in Jacksonville, and then you take it nationwide. Okay, but nuts and bolts question. Uh, let's say someone is particularly interested in, in addiction and trying to help there. Uh, where do you go? Do you study? Is there a, is there a job listing of of open positions there? How, how does it actually work? Well, this is, to some extent, the flip side of that antipathy toward religion that you and I were talking about before, Marvin. The fact that in academe, there's so much sneering at religion, so little willingness to take religion seriously on your average college campus. I know this college campus is different in that regard, but uh, it, because much of the social science infrastructure, most of the, much of the journalism mainstream conventional world are dismissive of religion, they are not seeing and understanding the tremendous power that faith has to change people's lives. And you know and I know that if you're talking about the really hard questions, like addiction or like helping a, provis a prisoner avoid returning to the life path he was on, in literally a majority of cases, you are talking about faith. There is no effective secular solution to those kinds of things. It has never been demonstrated that you can do it with money or with laws or with rules. You can do it with interchange. Interchange is, has tremendous power. So the large world out there that doesn't understand the language of interchange, of interchange that has never studied it, it doesn't take it seriously, that can't imagine its power is blind. You don't have competitors in that area. You have a wide open field. Those of you who have a sense of what faith is capable of motivating and, 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 and challenging and encouraging people to do. So that I think is, is a very exciting thing f for the shrinking number of people who do understand faith and who do practice faith and who are in touch with its, its, its powers. Uh, and, and I would really encourage you know those folks to to take, take advantage of that kind of the, 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 the backhanded compliment or the double-edged sword there. There's this, the, the fact that so much of the culture is going to be hostile to you when you go out there as a person of faith can work to your advantage if you turn it around. Well, that's certainly true. I guess I'm asking, where do you start? Do you, should, do you ask your pastor? Mm -hmm. uh, just, just, I think people are going, this, this, all, this all sounds great. Yep. Where do people start? Well, you know, anytime a philanthropist comes to us at the Philanthropy Roundtable and asks that kind of question, we do a little inventory. Can I start asking them questions? What, you know, what do you care about? Where do you come from? Okay. What matters to you? And I think that's what you should really do with yourself or have somebody else interrogate you if you need a third party to get in there. But first of all, what are you passionate about? What do you really care about? And there's no right or wrong answer. I mean, sometimes people come to us and they say, I want to put a million dollars into a cat shelter. And part of my stomach flips upside down and says, oh my gosh, I can think of so many better things to do. Or $100 million into Harvard, Lord knows. Um, there are people who want to do things that you won't agree with. And I try really hard not to judge that and to say, please don't do that. Because 
passion matters and enthusiasm and local knowledge matters. So if that person is really passionate about cats and knows a lot about cats and cares a lot about cats, they probably will make the world's best cat shelter. So God bless them, go for it. You, you do that if that's what you care about. And I think anybody uh, who's considering a career along these lines has to do much the same thing. You have to figure out what do you really care about? What are you willing to, to suffer for? Where do you think the, the upsides are? Uh, and then you do what everyone does. You, it's dirty, hard, slogging work. You, you develop expertise and knowledge. You study the, the exemplars, the people who really do it well. You ask a lot of questions. You find mentors. You find donors and funders. Uh, and you go to work. Okay. So you have to really chart your own path there. Uh, and it starts with, you know, what, are, what am I willing to sacrifice right. in order to achieve this objective? Right. Okay. Um, talk about public policy for a moment. I mean, you mentioned here... Um, which, which you know, I've seen the research on this, as, as you have and some other folks may have, uh, regular religious participation is correlated with many positive social outcomes. Less poverty, fewer divorces, more marital happiness, fewer births out of wedlock, less suicide, reduced binge drinking, less depression, better relationships. This is true among Americans of all demographic backgrounds. So if there were a, uh, a legal drug of some sort that you could prescribe to have, the, then people would say, wow, this is great, we yeah. have to push our resources into this. Yeah. Um, here it's, again, is there, there's a mismatch between what we know yeah. and what we are willing to do governmentally and often privately as well. Where do you start fighting that mismatch? Thank you for raising that because we've been talking about how, f mostly this, this evening, about how faith is a very powerful motivator f for people to help others. But as was just described, faith is also a very powerful tool for keeping yourself on track for keeping your, your own life on the rails and for avoiding veering off into the, into the, into the bushes uh, as you cruise down life's highway on your own. And there's all sorts of evidence for that. And of course, if you can head off these problems in advance, if you never develop the addiction, if you never experience the marital dissolution, if you never you know, have the child out of wedlock in the first place, you don't have to clean up afterwards. So that's really the first, the first preference, if, if at all possible, to uh, avoid the problem uh, to begin with. And, you know, it just kind of breaks my heart, Marvin, to answer your question. I mean, these ought to be obvious things. I mean, these are, these are, these are realities. These are documentable facts. Um, but I think we all know that society, storytelling, culture today is not rational. It's not based on facts. It's, it doesn't like charts and graphs of the kind that I produced in black and white in this article. It, 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 it likes it, uh, kind of romantic narratives. And the romantic narratives today are very, very different than this. Mm -hmm. They are all about letting your inner self out and, you know, finding your, 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 your liberating your, your, yourself into, into a, a, a new existence. And there's, there's, there's very little good advice uh, available to people today uh, as to what is the proper life sequence. What, what are the things you need to do to really ha end up with a, a satisfying and, and pleasing life, uh, at the end. And, um, you know, we have to get back to that. We, we really yeah. do. And, and, and public policy is the least of it. Um, I mean, public policy is not a bad place to start, but I'm much more concerned with the kind of the storytelling industries myself. Okay. I think the people who write books and make novels and TV shows and films and graphic novels, which we were talking about earlier, there's a huge opportunity there for people to, to, uh, to be instructed and to learn and to see examples uh, uh, that are not being seen today. You mentioned in uh, one of the articles you wrote for this publication just some religious frontiers, uh, beefed up seminaries, uh, fixing the facilities mismatch, we've, we've talked about that, um, and uh, assistance from churches to improve neighborhood health. Mm -hmm. But particularly, um, and then I'll go to your questions in just a moment, but uh, talk for just a moment about the beefed up seminaries and why that's important. Yeah, um, this is, again, such a simple thing. Uh, again, I'm, I'm a big uh, learn-from-history person. I think that, that it, almost everything has been tried or done at one point in, in life, and it's, it's crazy to reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. And, uh, again, let's take the charter school movement as, as a kind of a leading example here. When the charter schools first got to set up, they found that no matter how good their idea was or how much money they had in donor backers or anything else, if they couldn't get good teachers, they were done. They were in big trouble. And the people being churned out by the big st teacher colleges, the state teacher colleges, were, let's just say honestly, profoundly mediocre in way too many cases. They were not pe people who came uh, w with energy and with wisdom and with knowledge. 
And in the beginning, this was a huge anchor on the charter school movement. The charter school movement floundered, really, for its first five or mm -hmm. six years because it did not have a way to produce the alternative teaching core that it really needs. And then it finally figured that out, and they went into action. So what are the alternatives? Well, a, a number of the best charter school uh, chains set up their own teacher colleges, believe it or not. And they, they were really reluctant to do this. This is a major sort of move away from their normal mission. But they realized, if we don't create our own pipeline to supply our own teachers, we're not going to have them. Uh, TFA, Teach for America, as I mentioned, got started. And it... it, it lured into the teaching profession people who would otherwise have become investment bankers or, or law students, like Mar Marvin was saying earlier. Um, it made teaching a kind of an exciting and, and, and uh, socially uh, uh, acceptable kind of uh, profession for someone who was really ambitious and, and, and wanted to do big things. Um, anyway, we could do many of those same, same things on, on the leadership front uh, in religion. It, 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 with a relatively small number of scholarships, you could set up incubators where you, 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 you get... You help people do exactly what Marvin was asking me about 10 minutes ago. How do you get that person who has kind of an, a seed of an idea, but it's not really fully germinated? How do you get them over the hump? Well, maybe if we had a fellowship where you could sit down with a half dozen people who are a lot like you and in a similar stage of life, and you walk through the tools of creating a business plan, and they introduce you to mentors, and you, you learn basic entrepreneurial skills. You learn how to make a budget. You, you look into the philosophy and theology of some of the problems you want to attack. And at the end of that year, you come out as someone who really has earned a credential and an ability to operate that you didn't have when you went in. For relatively nickels on the dollar, I think we could do a lot of training in this area um, and uh, re really could ha have big effects on social problems. Okay, so lots of opportunities. Uh, questions? Microphone's over here and it'll pass it. There's a hand up in the back. <clears throat> Thank you for coming tonight. Um, one question that I uh, was wrote, wrote down is that um, so a lot of the ideas you're talking about uh, are similar to some reform efforts earlier in America's history, and I can think of like the uh, Second Great Awakening or the social gospel movement. And so what safeguards could not-for-profits employ to preserve robust, theolo robust theological foundation to avoid becoming just the, a social gospel movement with science data, and, and do you believe or have you observed that small decentralized startups would be able to convince more conservative congregations to be able to work with mainline Protestant denominations in achieving so social goals, or do you think that presents a th more of a theological problem in watering that down? You know, I don't want to discount the theological divisions. I think they are real, and, you know, that's what prevents people from handing these churches off to people who can make better use of them. I mean, we know about those fractures and those divisions. I think they're terribly unfortunate and really need to be fought against. I decided about, I don't know, 15 years ago that most of the stuff that my, my grandmother used to turn pale over, I mean, you know, the, the, the divisions between Catholics and Methodists or between different types of Baptists. It's silly in, in today's environment. The, the, the alliance today is between people who believe in God, who recognize that they are a small speck in a powerful universe made by something much vaster than they can understand, and the people who just think everything is atoms. That is the divide that really matters now. So I have no problem identifying with Orthodox Jews or Mormons or, or serious Catholics or, or evangelicals, those people are all people who speak a language and have a yearning and a questing that I get. I don't always go to the same places that they go in their conclusions, but that is a natural alliance that I, I feel. And I, I think people of faith have to f recognize that that is the new reality. And if they don't adjust to that, and if they keep their little schisms alive, we are all going to be divided and conquered to the point where there will be no counterweight to the mass, secular, very anti-religious culture that dominates much of elite American society. So that's the, the first thing. As far as that, you're quite right. This is, again, like I've been saying, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. I just finished a novel about... Um, uh, basically the Second Great Awakening, some of the great leaders of the Second Great Awakening who were businessmen, who made a lot of money, who also happen to have deep, powerful, profoundly uh, motivating Christian uh, motivations and who did amazing things. Uh, the protagonists of my novel, among other things, were the, the two men who pretty much popularized abolitionism. Right? Abolitionism was considered a really fringy, 
uh, kind of extreme movement in the 1820s, 1830s. And it became a popular movement, became a mass movement. It became the norm eventually, obviously. And that didn't just happen. That yeah. really required people to get in there and invest effort. The, and the, the Tappan Brothers. The Tappan Brothers is what I'm referring to. Yes, they're the, the heroes of, of my novel. They did all kinds of other wonderful things too. For instance, they were really big in, in giving energy and, uh, to the Sunday school movement, which again, sounds like one of those kind of dry, dusty, marginal things. The Sunday school movement was not marginal. The Sunday school movement was m more important in, in teaching kids their ABCs and their math in addition to the values that they got, the Christian values they got in Sunday school, than our traditional schools were for about a 50 year period. A lot of historians will tell you this, that Sunday schooling had more to do with the fact that the American uh, workforce became the most uh, effective in the world by the time of about the Civil War than anything else that, that happened. So these are big, big uh, uh, social effects that were produced by religiously motivated people um, and they took their bullets. I mean, the Tappan brothers, one of the Tappan brothers, for instance, had his home attacked by thugs. He escaped with his family, luckily. They, they broke into his house. They dragged all of his household goods out into the street. I mean, his children's toys and his wife's nightgown was, were paraded. His, the portraits were ripped off the walls and, and destroyed. And they threw it all in the street and, and lit it in the bonfire. So you have to be brave to do what I'm talking about here. You will be attacked, all right? You will be harassed. People have been forever. Uh, who stood up to be counted in this area. But you can have an effect. The, the, these, uh, these two brothers, uh, as I say, basically popularized abolition. One of, the, one of the brothers was the guy, and this story has never been told. I mean, the, the Steven Spielberg movie made about this was dreadfully ahistorical. But the Amistad case, some of you may know about, where a slave ship was actually taken over by the slaves and then eventually beached on Long Island. The slaves were arrested for, for having murdered a couple of the crew. And, and one of the Tappan brothers raced up to Long Island Sound when he heard about this, he realized this is a teachable moment. This is a moment where Americans can be made to understand what slavery really means. And what would you have done if you had been uh, grabbed up, put in irons, and enslaved by somebody? Would you not have fought for your life? Is that not self-defense? And he organized the legal defense. Uh, he, 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 he brought these, these uh, slaves to church. He taught them English. He uh, got John Quincy Adams to serve as their lawyer. He paid every penny of their legal costs, and, and, he, and he organized a huge media campaign to have articles in the newspapers every single day telling the stories of what the Mendes were up to today. It became a, a, the O.J. Simpson case of its day. It was a massive spectacle and had a huge effect in transforming the mind. So there are opportunities here. There are things that can be done. Uh, I don't want to say that it's easy, but uh, your invocation of the Second Great Awakening is, is very useful because this is, uh, this is something Americans know how to do. Other questions? Well, thanks for coming out uh, tonight. I had a question. You were talking about resource allocation in the church. Do you think that there's something in the church similar to Adam Smith's invisible hand that can direct the allocation of church resources in a way that's most effective without having some sort of centralized planner in charge? Well, you know, the invisible hand is generally thought to kind of operate on a large scale. It's when you have lots of little micro decisions aggregating to, 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 to have a social result. I mean, most churches are, are much smaller scale than that. They, 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 you don't get lost in your average church. I mean, you can. I've been to Lakewood Church, and I, you know, it's, it's a weird thing to be worshiping with 20,000 people. But most of our churches, we're worshiping, worshiping with 200 people, all right? And it's enough people that you can actually know every single person. That's one of the joys of worshiping with someone. You really have that level of intimacy. So I don't think we need to think about or worry too much about invisible hands. I think we can be pretty open and transparent and democratic about this. Um, you know, I, I think that the, it's, it's really about what do we value, what do we see as problems, how much do we want to, to, to uh, protect what we have versus reach out to others who have nothing. I mean, those are the kinds of classic Christian decisions that have to get made over and over every generation. They're not always easy, um, but we have a really good rule book uh, that tells us how to navigate these. Um, and, uh, you know, Scripture is pretty good about saying, get out of your comfort zone. Get used to talking to people who don't share your values, you know. There is no East or West, uh, you know. Eating with tax collectors and, and, and prostitutes and sinners. I mean, there is a long, there is a long tradition of, of encouragement within the Christian faith to, to really step out and try things that are not comfortable, take risks, 
uh, and uh, in, in the in the end, you'll be you'll you'll you'll, you'll find that you're you're serving, serving something bigger and more satisfying than you ever imagined. Yeah. So my question has to do with. Um, well, I really liked what you said about like the churches being the center of society and like these beautiful churches that are no longer used, right? Um, whereas you have some very vibrant congregations that could be utilizing these like play, hubs of society, if you will. Mm. And so I guess my question has to do with how does the church, because I think a lot of these, for lack of a better term, like high school churches that are meeting in these little institutions have a strong desire to main, maintain the purpose of feeding the body of believers um, and are kind of scared that if they do too much of the outreach method, that they'll lose that. And so how does the church kind of keep that tension of everything you're talking about, which isn't really necessary to come from the church and not losing its, its goal of feeding the body of believers? That's a really wise question. And, and, and I don't want to misportray my own position here. You know, as, 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 as interested as, as I am in all of these forms of social outreach, that is not the main thing I want from my church. It is not the main thing I think most people want from their churches. I don't think it's the most important work that the church does. The most important work that the church does is to help us find quiet moments where we really feel God's presence and feel like we can communicate back and forth. That's hard to do. It's, it's extremely important. It's something that people outside of faith just they don't get it. They don't get it at all. They don't understand why you'd want to give money for that. They don't even understand why you'd want to devote time to that, why you'd want to put energy into it. It is tremendously important to kind of charging your batteries, to sort of finding your perspective within the universe, to, to sort of keeping your life on the rails. So that is really worthy, and I have no problem with churches making that job one. It's hard. It's really hard. And you don't want to get distracted into social work to the point where you lose that. But in a well-functioning church, there is usually extra energy that wants to do extra things. And indeed, again, to go back to the scriptures, the scriptures say that is actually one of the ways you find purpose. And one of the ways you find that kind of compass inside of you is to go out and do the scary evangel evangelizing or to help someone in need or to, to really extend yourself. That, that can be very, very satisfying. Um, so I don't think these are, these are oppositional things. I think they often feed each other. I think that um, very often people who are really blooming in their own faith are doing a lot of both. Um, and uh, again, that's not just my conclusion. That's what Paul tells us. That's what a lot of people uh, through, the, through, the, through our, our, our history have, uh, have, have discovered uh, through trial and error. Thanks so much for coming out. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer seemed to be of the opinion that at some point the church as a whole, right, has a responsibility or a role to play in the direction, um, or at least to comment on the direction in which society is headed. Of course, his circumstances were extraordinary, but would you see the church now become involved in, and maybe not political commentary, but definitely social commentary as a whole, as kind of as a as voice that mm -hmm. goes beyond individual churches? Well, I certainly don't like the idea, which is becoming increasingly common, that there is no place for churches or for religious views in the public square. I think that's really dangerous, truly un-American, and very, very uh, destructive to good problem solving. Um, again, I, 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 I don't want my church to make that their first mission. I mean, I just, I just think that there... Politics is a, is a very difficult world to navigate. It corrupts almost everyone who gets into it. I think it, there's a very high chance it would corrupt churches that get into it uh, too extensively. That's a very personal view. I'm not, I, I, don't, I wouldn't prescribe that necessarily. To, but I, I think, as I say, that there are two just vast, wide-open green fields that churches have to themselves today. One is this inner, you know, spiritual nurturing that is job one for the church that I described earlier. And the other is this social outreach using the tools of faith that give you an ability to reach addicts and convicts and really broken people in a way that no secular social worker can reach them. Those are such promising open fields where there are relatively few barriers to entry that I don't, I just can't think of putting a lot of horsepower into politics as a better alternative than working on those two things. Now, that said, Churches at least have to play defense. I mean, I, we are getting to the point. Like I say, if, if, if the New York Times is proposing to take away the tax exemption for churches, it's time to fight back. 
Somebody needs to organize that and to say that that's, that, that's a serious constitutional infringement. Um, so I, I, I don't want to be naive. I recognize that you, you have to have a voice in the public square and that certainly churchgoers as citizens should not be afraid or intimidated out of bringing their, their uh, religiously based perspectives on important issues into their, into their public discussions. But the church per se, uh, I think probably has better uses for its energy. Well, we're almost out of time. Uh, any of you ever read uh, a children's book called The Bed Book by a poet, Sylvia Plath? Uh, anyway, I, I, I recommend it because uh, uh, it's, a, it's a book with pictures of all different types of beds. Mm. And her basic line is, you know, not just a uh, tight little, white little, nighty night little, uh, turn out the light little bed, instead, an elephant bed, a tank bed, a jungle bed, all kinds of exciting things. And I expect, in a way, that's what you're saying here, that uh, if any of you are looking toward graduation and on the one hand, embarking on a career, but at the same time, uh, a little bit frightened of embarking on a career or wondering, am I going to be locked in to something? Mm -hmm. uh, this is a time to be adventurous. Right? I, um, our, our dean here is getting a little worried as I, as I wax on about that. But uh, no, this is, this is uh, no, not, not just a, a tight little framework. Oh, um, yeah. I adventure. Mean, absolutely. I mean, that's, that, that's, those are such wise words. I mean, you will never be more free and less constrained than you are right now. And this really is the time to, to take some risks and to jump off the diving board. Just remember your ancestors. I mean, don't, don't be so afraid. My grandmother cooked on a wood-burning stove, had no indoor plumbing until she was 36 years old, all right? The idea that I'm gonna die if I don't have a jacuzzi or something is absurd. You, you, you have to just realize how many of the, the constraints that we put on ourselves are self-imposed. You can walk away from so much stuff and it is so liberating. Marvin mentioned I live on a houseboat now. We had the usual big three-story Victorian house that everyone has when you're raising kids. I own five canoes. and it, I had so much junk, it was unbelievable. And when I first thought about getting rid of it, I was a little panicked. And when I got rid of all that stuff, I felt so light. I felt so free. I felt so able to focus on thinking about stuff I cared about and going places I wanted to go and being with people I wanted to be with and working on things I wanted to work because I didn't have to maintain all that stuff and pay for that stuff. So don't let the stuff get you down and be an adventurer. The, the American spirit is extremely adventurous. As I say, these Tappan brothers took all kinds of risks. Their businesses, they were basically, basically in the end run out of business, all right? Their businesses were boycotted and blacklisted and shut down and they lost everything. Um, but they did not die on happy men. Please join me in thanking an adventurous Carl Zinsmeister. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you.